What makes a good overland vehicle? That is precisely the question I'm going to be answering on today's video, as well as sharing some general considerations that you may want to take into account whether you are about to purchase your first overland vehicle or perhaps looking to upgrade to something new. So let's get right into it. Let's kick things off by talking about a vehicle's ability to carry all the gear that you will likely want to bring with you on a trip, whether you're going out for a weekend or for a trip that might be a week, two weeks, even a month long. It's often surprising the amount of gear that will add up and the amount of room you may need to make to carry all the gear you want to bring with you. Now, one consideration here, of course, is the physical size of the vehicle because that is going to determine how many people and how much gear you can fit inside or on top of your rig. But of course, it's not just as simple as bigger is better because depending on where you are traveling, you may encounter things like super tight switchbacks or very narrow trails that you need to navigate. And in those instances, having a larger rig like a full-size truck can actually become a little bit of a liability. And this is one of the reasons why you see so many forerunners, land cruisers, four door wranglers, Tacomas, gladiators, etc., etc., being built up as overland rigs because they hit a certain sweet spot in terms of vehicle size. They're large enough to accommodate more than a couple people and a ton of gear, but at the same time, they're not so big that they don't fit on any of the trails you may want to go and run. Now, while we're on the subject of vehicle size, another consideration here beyond just the overall physical size of the vehicle is the vehicle's total maximum payload number. This is a number that represents what the manufacturer has determined is the maximum amount of weight that the vehicle can carry, inclusive of the driver, all passengers, all cargo, and any modifications that may be bolted onto the vehicle. And if you're curious how to find this number for your vehicle, it can typically be located on a sticker on the inside of the driver's side door panel, as you can see here. So if my vehicle has a GVWR of 6,860 pounds and a vehicle curb weight of 5,401 pounds, it leaves me with a total payload capacity of 1,459 pounds. Now that number might sound like a lot, but you would be surprised how quickly you can approach and even exceed a vehicle's gross vehicle weight rating. For example, let's say that you're traveling with two passengers, you have a full drawer system, rock sliders, steel bumpers, a winch, rooftop tent, and onboard water. It is very likely that you may be at or beyond your vehicle's GVWR. So this is definitely something to take into account, especially depending on how heavy you want to load things up and how much gear you want to bring with you. So my suggestion would be to really sit down and think through what you want your vehicle build to look like. Are you going to go simple and lightweight? Because if you are, your options are much more plentiful. If you want to start adding on armor and drawer systems and a rooftop tent, et cetera, et cetera, that may limit your options a little bit more in terms of finding a vehicle that has enough payload capacity and enough physical size to carry everything that you need. Of course, if you wanna carry a ton of gear and a ton of people, you may wanna consider something like a half ton truck, which is going to be larger in size and have a larger payload capacity. Of course, at that point, you again need to weigh the benefits and the cons because your vehicle may at that point be too large to tackle some of the trails that you might want to take on. In my personal experience, ground clearance is the most common vehicle limitation when off-road and running out of ground clearance is the most likely thing to force a reroute or even worse, potentially get you high centered and stuck on an obstacle. Because the thing is, even fairly well-maintained forest service roads can pretty quickly become rough in spots. Sometimes that may mean deep ruts, other times it may mean potholes, and it could also mean just large rocks or ledges in the trail that you really have no choice but to go up and over. And it is here that having a vehicle with at least decent ground clearance can make all the difference between continuing along your route or having to reroute and go back the way you came. Now, in terms of how much ground clearance you actually need, it's gonna depend on a number of factors, where you're planning on going, how far out into the backcountry you wanna get, 
But as a general rule, I think the minimum number that you're looking for here is probably somewhere around eight inches if you're mostly going to be traveling on forest service roads and maintained dirt roads and things of that nature. Of course, more ground clearance is better and depending on certain circumstances, eight inches, maybe even nine inches of ground clearance may not be ideal or even enough to get over some more difficult obstacles. And just for a little bit of a personal reference, my own Lexus LX470, which with the larger tires I have on it, it has roughly about 10 inches of ground clearance to the lowest point underneath, which is the rear differential, or about 12 to 13 inches of ground clearance to the frame when the suspension is in its, in its highest setting. And even still, when I'm tackling more difficult obstacles, I run out of ground clearance from time to time, even with those numbers. Yeah, dude. Now, the good news here is that almost no matter what vehicle you have, there are likely some options where you can increase your ground clearance, whether that is adding a larger set of tires or going out and getting a lift kit that may buy you an extra two to three inches, which can make all the difference when you're out on the trail. Okay, so we've established that ground clearance is super important when you are off-road. However, something that really shouldn't be overlooked is on-road comfort. Because let's be honest, for most of us, the majority of our time will be spent on pavement. And if your idea of overlanding has you traveling to faraway places, the bulk of those miles just getting there and getting home are gonna be spent on the highway. And so on-road comfort is something that in my view should not be overlooked. It's also one of the things that really separates an overland vehicle and what makes a good overland vehicle versus just a dedicated rock crawler or off-roader where on-road comfort really isn't all that important. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that you need to be coddled in S-class level comfort with massaging seats and all of that. But the truth is a vehicle that is capable and comfortable chewing up miles on the highway, whether that be hundreds of miles or even thousands of miles can make a big difference in your willingness and desire to explore further away from home. And this is one thing that really separates a good overland vehicle build from a dedicated off-roader or rock crawler build. Because if you are building a dedicated rock crawler or off-roader, putting on 37 inch tires and a massive suspension lift is probably a fine idea. But if you're going to be traveling hundreds or thousands of miles on pavement, then you're going to be doing that at the expense of on-road comfort. Generally speaking, the more that you do to make your vehicle better off-road, the more that you're doing to make it worse on-road. And so when considering an overland vehicle build or a platform for an overland vehicle, you should take into consideration both and try and find somewhat of a happy medium. Speaking of capability off-road, one of the most useful features that you can have in an overland vehicle, in my opinion, is a low range transfer case. What this allows you to do is to travel much more slowly while still staying in the usable power band of the engine and at the same time multiplying the amount of torque that is available. And this has a whole host of benefits. For example, if you are climbing a super steep incline, it allows you to do so at a much slower and more controlled speed while not putting undue stress on your vehicle's transmission. On the opposite end of things, if you are going down a super steep decline, it allows you to, again, control your vehicle's speed to descend much slower while not overworking your brakes. It also has the benefit of allowing you to navigate difficult obstacles in, you guessed it, a slower and controlled manner. And when it comes to off-roading, generally speaking, slower is better you start breaking stuff when you go too fast. Now, I know that there are gonna be plenty of people watching this video who are going to be saying, you don't need a low range transfer case to get out and go off road and overland. And you know what? Uh, those people honestly are absolutely right. You don't. There are plenty of people out there in Subarus and other crossovers who are out in the backcountry and overlanding and you don't need it, but there is no denying the fact that adding a low range transfer case to a vehicle is going to make it much more capable of taking you further off road. And that's a good thing, isn't it? For many of us, overlanding is synonymous with getting out into the backcountry, away from civilization and a cell phone signal. 
but the further you are out from civilization and when you don't have a cell phone signal, it means you're that much further away from help. And this is where having a vehicle that is reliable, a vehicle you can depend on, can make getting out into the backcountry not only much safer, but also much less stressful. As a side note, if you've ever wondered why the Toyota tax is so steep, it's because people who are looking to get out in the backcountry and get out off-road put a premium on dependability and reliability. My LX470, for example, has over a quarter million miles on it, and it still runs like it's brand new. But it has also been well-maintained throughout its life. And that brings me to my next point which is preventative maintenance. Because whether you're looking at a Toyota or any other sort of vehicle, how dependable and reliable that vehicle is can often be attributed to how well maintained it has been and how much preventative maintenance the owner had the foresight to do before they got out into the backcountry 100 miles away from civilization. So don't be a dummy. Do your preventative maintenance. You will thank me, I promise. Well. There you have it. These have been five traits of a great overland vehicle. But there's still one more thing. If you have a vehicle that does not possess all five of the traits I just mentioned, please don't think that it means you can't get out and explore and have a good time overlanding. I guarantee that there are people whose vehicle possess none of the traits I just mentioned who are out there having a great time exploring and overlanding. Yes, it means your vehicle may not take you as deep into the backcountry or as safely, but it doesn't mean that you can't get out there and get started. So just go and have fun. And if you enjoyed this video, then you'll definitely want to check out this one next. See you later. Bye-bye.